Neil is an awesome hacker. He runs a team of hackers who are responsible for every KiwiCon most likely to get arrested award in its history. It's true, actually. I think <laughs> Anyway, tag. Yeah. That would be really... Thank you. One sec. Um, I'm going to move this so I can see my notes, but um, I, I didn't realize that, that my company had won that award every, every time. It was, it was all mischievous, not malicious uh, uh, research outcomes. So, uh, um, but uh, uh, I am actually a, a um, excuse me, an offensive security professional, so uh, people engage me to break into their systems, and we do a lot of work in the higher education space. Because it's fun, and you have big networks, and it's really interesting to work in them. Um, uh, my background, I guess, in, in uh, uh, relation to, to, to that is uh, um, I, I, my background prior to being in security was as uh, I was a Unix admin um, and a VMS administrator going way back to the early 90s. Um, I worked in the uh, education space in um, educational television in the US, and uh, then for a project called the Virtual Hospital at the University of Iowa was uh, vh.org, but is uh, an, an early internet uh, property that now has been sort of uh, uh, rolled into the University of Iowa's healthcare system. Um, but it was a, a uh, in, in that era, we, we had a lot of sort of patient um, and clinical information for people to, unfortunately, it was, it was uh, sort of Dr. Google before Google was, uh, was around. Um, and it was a great place for people to self-diagnose. And then as the person who received the webmaster email, um, they would send me questions, like medical questions, which uh, I would pass on to people who knew what they were doing. But um, so, yeah. So we're we're uh, today what we're, we're going to do really quickly is to go through differences in the way I see controls in uh, enterprises, like generic enterprises versus uh, uh, higher education networks, um, which in many ways contain an enterprise network and a lot of other things around it. Um, and then we'll go through hopefully some quick uh, wins as well. Um, to address uh, issues that we talked about. Um, some of the, the things I, and issues in, that, that I, I note will be things that, that, uh, um, like that Chris has covered, but also there, there are things that you will have encountered. Um, uh, some of these, the advice that I give uh, will be practices that you've been doing for years and some may be um, uh, uh, things that may be new to you. So I guess in comparing the, the, the two types of environment, if I have a really simple enterprise network drawn up here, um, uh, it's a, it's kind of a boring enterprise network, so bring your own device. There's none of these things that I think that uh, um, have been longer term challenges in uh, higher education networks than they have necessarily been in the enterprise because you know, b before BYOD was a defined thing, that was uh, uh, what you had to deal with as far as um, um, students and uh, researchers and so on and people bringing their own equipment and sort of attaching to the network. Um, so that's a that's a newer you know issue for for enterprise. It's more of the last you know six seven eight years. Um, but uh, so where we actually see controls in enterprises is that, that we obviously see perimeter controls. So we see uh, network uh, firewall controls on the borders. We see traffic inspection that happens at that point, um, content inspection, these sort of things. Um, within the central networks, we might see a little more controls, but more often than not, a lot of enterprises run large flat. Uh, open WANs, there's not a, a lot of compartmentalization. Um, the kind of things that tend to drive them to segment their networks, the same things that would drive you to segment yours. Um, issues, uh, 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 roving malware, um, a worm type uh, uh, behavior from, from, from technology spreading through the environments. Um, but for the enterprise, like we generally have that whole classic, you know, crunchy outside around a soft chewy center uh, that uh, Bill Cheswick has uh, talked about for years, but um, it's, uh, uh, ingress is generally strong as far as the access controls in the enterprise network, and egress is okay. Um, I find Australia, on average, to be better than what we had in the U.S. I think the U.S., because of just the availability of bandwidth and not having a history of bandwidth being expensive, it's, it's less, enterprises deal with less 
uh, proxied um, uh, traffic, so things are more directly natted, leaving like a private network or, you know, in the case of universities, um, uh, and, and this is something that you, that you would have a, a history of as well, of, of directly routing lots of address space um, to the world. So um, for, for enterprises, like this is a, a uh, uh, we have this, this really this sort of moat around um, what is generally a, a fairly soft network. Um, and that's probably uh, not that uncommon. I'll actually skip over this because same thing. Uh, versus a higher education network. So um, just done a, a sort of simple representation of uh, how I uh, see uh, higher education networks, um, uh, especially where controls apply. So generally we will have uh, uh, perimeter controls that happen at, uh, at, at border devices, usually uh, access control lists and routers. Um, and um, I probably should actually have, have said why I'm even sort of going over all this. Um, I, I look at your controls and then I try to basically in, invert that and look where I can find my advantages as an attacker. And so I'm looking for places basically to get a toehold in your environment, whether it's uh, externally from the internet or over uh, a proximity-based attack like a wireless network or something like that, or whether it's you know, coming into your environment and unplugging systems and trying to access the network and whether or not you prevent me from doing that. Um, but so we have a lot of uh, perimeter control focus on the border device. Um, generally, it's just a noise filter. There's just uh, things you don't want, obviously, entering, leave, entering your network, generally not so much leaving, um, that you'll filter there, uh, SMB, CIFS, like stuff that is probably not going to have an internet-facing purpose, but there's still plenty of things that uh, are uh, effectively routed um, uh, are accessible through that environment because of the fact that, that it's just a, a screen at some level. Um, within, and this is something that we, we've seen as a, as a, a change over the last um, probably seven or eight years that a lot of universities are going through transformation projects to sort of uh, re-implement solutions and to introduce control layers in them. It's a data center model and I think it's a recognition that your internal networks are semi-trusted um, and that they're also worth protecting um, the on-campus, on-premise um, systems from as well. So. Uh, uh, that is, is something that's a very effective initiative that uh, many uh, universities that we've uh, worked with have, have been uh, adopting uh, out of necessity and also just you know, being able to manage um, these systems. What we do see is that there's a lot of, again, focus on ingress controls into these environments and maybe even down through the tiers of the environments down to where your data is stored in uh, um, a set of database, uh, uh, large database environments. But um, uh, egress um, going out of that environment, um, controls within devices in that environment um, uh, are a little uh, less consistent. Um, I've really obviously oversimplified this. Most uh, major applications in university are siloed, um, and, and they would have for each application these sort of layers actually implemented through them. Um, so um, as we sort of get out to the more distributed campus, um, there's, there's obviously sort of uh, uh, remote sites that may or may not have uh, network controls, um, uh, uh, controlling access in and out of those, um, uh, but often these things are left out just because you never know what someone's going to be operating at those sites, and it's also just part of the bit of the spirit of um, striking a balance between uh, a network that someone like me would recommend where it's no fun and it's all controls um, versus uh, actually being able to, to get to the business of research and education done. Um, but there's this other network that, for me, is my favorite network, um, which is your guys' network generally in this, this community. It's the out-of-band networks that actually touch on all the, the infrastructure devices. And um, so my goal often is to breach a device that then in turn is connected to that, and then I use its trust to connect to the other devices in the, the management networks. And I attack the management stations, because that's really where I, I uh, get most of my uh, uh, success from. So um, instead of moving on, uh, these are things that uh, many of you in, in the university space uh, manage and deal with. Like, these are the, the major sort of enterprise and business applications of the university. Um, as a, an attacker of these things, like we, we know that there's you know, five or six major products basically in each category, and it's on us to, to be familiar with uh, um, what implementations of these look like, but also to, 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 to have a, in, in our uh, arsenal a lot of uh, attacks on uh, particular technologies. Um, that you procure. Many of these then in turn are, are, are very, um, sorry, are uh, uh, integrated with all the other authoritative systems of the university. So financial systems, the student information systems is a big one, um, human resources systems for staff information. Uh, and 
so for, for us, sometimes the game is attacking um, the uh, data asset itself. Sometimes it is attacking the integrated systems that actually relate to that. Um, and there's certain systems that, uh, especially these days, like really provide us a lot more, um, I guess, uh, reach uh, whenever we attack them. So um, for, for people who work in managing security in higher education, like it is uh, uh, really uh, a, a, it's the same challenges as an enterprise, but has the, the, the usual challenges that you have a, you know, a carrier size network or as large as any enterprise but uh, each, each technology team has you know, two or three people, if we're lucky in some cases. So uh, I'm always impressed with uh, uh, how, how far uh, uh, automation and uh, just trying to, to, to build management tools goes as far as uh, uh, rolling out large environments and supporting with small teams. But um, uh, for me, uh, uh, a lot of people uh, really got their sort of first taste of, of internet uh, and uh, type hacking uh, when they were at university, and so you have that that uh, fun inverted threat model where um, you know you, you do have some in, insider threat um, uh, from that's a, a resident threat effectively, especially in the case where you have uh, uh, high speed comms to residential halls and colleges and so on. So. Um, and for me as well, like the big challenge of the last five or six years, and uh, everybody who's doing cloud stuff loves using this this uh, uh, Simpson slide. I'm like I, I like it. Um, but uh, as you as you manage these sort of shifts of on-premise uh, information into uh, uh, cloud hosting, um, it starts out with the general services. Obviously, like uh, a lot of uh, a lot of organizations have relocated their staff and student um, email into various cloud services. And uh, employee self-service human resources systems were some of the first that we were encountering uh, with both universities and with enterprises where there was a hybrid deployment model of an on-premise and uh, cloud-based uh, solution. And it's primarily for the practical uh, uh, reason that you know, people leave a job and they still want to have access to their um, you know, tax information, payroll stuff, things like that. So it makes sense to have this, this split. But, um, uh, that can also um, uh, lead to problems as well. So uh, um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about multi-tenanted um, cloud solutions in a bit because um, we've we've been having a lot of fun with this. But we get this. Um, it's it's a. Uh, it just seems that that uh, uh, as technology always goes through these waves of centralization and decentralization, like uh, over history, um, uh, this is this is yet another one, and we get to manage. You know, we had a, a period of time where we had a somewhat containable perimeter, um, and now that becomes less and less defined until you know, the game is actually making this uh, all, all work. So we have uh, trust extended to these external um, uh, services. Uh, there are good and bad ways that that trust is integrated um, as far as, and it's generally authentication identity management to enable these uh, external uh, application providers to provide um, data to your, um, to your users. So, but, um, yeah, so we'll go on from here. So um, I guess these are the things that I want to go through that, that we take advantage of um, as, as an attacker in this space. So um, not surprisingly, uh, network segmentation, segregation um, is uh, always uh, uh, something that we're um, keen to take advantage of. And um, uh, we really try to look for uh, inconsistencies. So we'll, we'll find a, a well-controlled environment and we try to find that one place that we can um, uh, get some sort of uh, position to the environment to pivot to then attack uh, other parts of the environment. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a needle in haystack scenario for us, but it's, it's one of these situations where um, this is all kind of stacked in our favor. Um, we have to find that one wrong thing and build on it, build on it, build on it, and technology professionals have to get it right every single time somehow, which is just not gonna happen. So you know what the main thing that we have to do in, in recognizing that is that it, it's an it's an incident uh, focused world and there will be issues you will have uh, incidents and you will need to uh, to be prepared to deal with them. So um, uh, looking at my simplified um, uh, network, I wanted to sort of go through where I see um, controls in the network and whether or not they're effective or not. Um, so we see these again these these perimeter controls. Um, they're uh, variably effective until we get to uh, the new data center type models um, uh, where we have a lot more uh, order and segregation in that just because they've been designed with that in mind. Um, um, for many organizations, it's a multi-year process, obviously, to move these major applications over into this kind of containered uh, model. Um, but it's, it's something that uh, uh, the, the more you can segregate 
uh, things, the more you can regulate the, how they're actually uh, operating. Um, and uh, let's see, so other places we'll see controls. I, I wanted to mark this this way. We always can do better on the border. Um, I, I, I realize that going back in history, you know, the practicality of being able to do something like have a device that was capable of you know, keeping track of you know, NAT state for a couple of class B's worth of address space, you know, was, was uh, uh, something that was impractical. Just like um, doing inspection and filtering at high speeds is something that is expensive, uh, uh, but sometimes is impossible um, to, to do detailed uh, traffic inspection on, you know, 10 and 20 gig um, uh, uh, perimeters to, to networks. Uh, let alone in the middle of the network in the core. Um, I guess one point I want to make about um, segmentation and controls and that is to try to break the problem down um, to not uh, have to, like, when you get to the network core itself, you're going to be dealing with, obviously, the core network speed. But uh, your, your networks are organized by departments and faculties anyway, um, trying to break the control uh, application down um, so you're not doing all of your filtering in one big central place, which requires like a, a huge investment in that. And I think that um, software-defined networking, um, uh, while I'm interested in it as an attacker, because anything you can define with software, you can potentially subvert with that definition as well, but it's a good way to break down the problem. Um, so you can, while you're defining all these, these, these separate networks, you can obviously apply controls uh, and, and do inspection at smaller sort of block levels as opposed to doing the whole thing at once. Um, but uh, other places that we see controls maybe are, are in some of these, these uh, uh, I guess, more distributed areas, but mostly we find um, uh, internal networks, um, uh, there may be some separation of staff and student networks, but uh, often there isn't that. Um, uh, there may be separation in wireless of staff and student networks, um, or whether it's separate SSIDs, separate lanes into the environment, or whether it's just magic done on the other side of an SSID based on someone's identity. Um, so we, we do see some of that, but there's a lot of, of kind of commingled parts of the environment. Um, and where they're physically accessible to us is where it gets um, sort of fun and interesting. So going into labs, unplugging things, um, putting Dropbox devices in, um, using data ports on phones. Um, you know, so we will, we've, we've built a number of these sort of devices. I, I um, was actually presented on one a couple of months ago where we took a a $10 um, uh, uh, ARM-based kind of Raspberry Pi clone called an Orange Pi and made an, uh, an, a Dropbox that we are able to put um, in the wall, power from PoE, and use it to attack, uh, uh, remotely attack the, the Ada one x authenticated sessions um, through that. So even strong controls can be attacked as well. But anyway, um, so uh, I, I mentioned before about how uh, we now, egress um, coming out of the data center networks um, uh, within the nodes of the data center networks is something that um, uh, we think that there's lots of room for improvement. Um, because uh, you are managing things on scale and often you'll be building solutions knowing that, well, this is a, a web presented application that's going to sit behind a load balancer, is going to have an application service layer, and is going to have a data store layer. You'll build these design patterns up um, that you can use to accommodate uh, new applications of that type so you have some consistency, but also to, so you don't have hundreds and hundreds of different specific uh, descriptions for controls, um, which I think there's a lot of history in um, universities where uh, network access controls were used and the responsibility for defining the requirements of those were distributed um, throughout uh, the institution. Um, and uh, again, there's the out-of-band network that we always find really interesting. Um, another big win for us as an attacker is um, all of the moves to, to tie things back to single sign-on and identity management and directory integration. It's great. It's great from manageability. It's great from uh, accountability generally if you are actually tracking um, uh, where users go and what they do. But um, as an attacker, um, directories have always been something that if we, if we can breach the directory, then we can control whatever the directory can control. And as more things look to centralize directories, and whether it's as an identity management system that flows down to separate directory services like LDAP and then Active Directory, or whether um, it is all roads leading back to Active Directory, um, but some of the most unholy things I feel like I see is uh, when I see um, Unix systems backend authentication onto Active Directory. Like I know it's it's the world that we live in, but it just seems it just feels wrong to me um, because uh, it means that the security of those systems uh, sits with the security of Active Directory, and so it comes down to uh, how well that's been secured. So 
Um, I, I used to work in high performance computing and uh, it's still my favorite area to target in universities and because the sort of front end and gateway and control workstation type nodes that let you into that environment are directory integrated, I get in by attacking that. So, um, but uh, um, one particular condition that we, we find often is um, where we'll find that there's been uh, uh, introduced Active Directory into the new data center model. Um, this system sits within there to service requests for devices that are in the data center, um, but then it has a replica that sits outside of it um, that's in the general network that we may or may not have you know, some sort of access to. It doesn't, may not have the same kind of network control approach applied to it and so on, but it's still something that for us comes back to um, uh, uh, if we can control the, the directory and can, can you know, create a user in it or grant our user additional rights, obviously that can be beneficial. So dropping ourselves into groups that let us on to, in, in, in the case of, of people in this audience, network management infrastructure is a big, uh, big part of that for us. So I mean, where that becomes uh, fun for us is either when um, users reuse their directory-based password on internet-facing applications or there's directory-integrated internet-facing applications and we have the opportunity to to guess uh, uh, user identities from that. Um, so uh, once we've, we've managed to, to, to get some kind of valid user, and sometimes it's uh, like there's, there's a common practice we find where um, uh, lectern uh, or PCs used in, in lecture halls have a, like a presentation user that's logged in. Um, so we've VPNed it into the university as that um, when we, we've identified it. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's there's, there's generally a practice to grant remote access to most users who are defined in the directory, um, whether they're people or not in some cases. Um, so it's probably narrowing that down, although the intent is obviously just to give access to that um, semi-trusted network, but um, make sure that the, the rest of the network also semi-trusts that semi-trusted network. So um, so on uh, 82 x um, uh, uh, it isn't the, you know, there's no such, like the, you always have to have these, uh, uh, you know, there's no silver bullet, like there's no, like these sort of things that people will, will say in, in, in security. And um, uh, 802.1x and wired 802.1x um, has its limitations, um, but it stops me from, you know, going into your lab and uh, unplugging a, a, a managed system that has maybe 802.1x to authenticate that lab system in and plugging something in and introducing something uh, from that. So uh, they, it, it does have a, have, a, have a good purpose, however, there's just a common misunderstanding that people have that um, uh, wired 802.1x um, provides encryption when it just provides port authentication. And um, so that's why my $10 Dropbox device sitting in front of that lets me attack an authenticated session um, for a user and to use their, their, use their identity but also to, to sniff all the data that's not um, protected by application transports. So, um, uh, peep. Uh, uh, E-peep is a problem, um, and it, it has been for years, but now it's, there's a lot of specific conditions that will, could lead to someone uh, uh, tricking one of your users into providing them with, um, uh, in some cases, it's just the, the hash form of the user's identity when they connect to the network, um, uh, but depending on what you lead the user to do, you may be able to get them to uh, provide those identities in other ways. Um, the only reason I really mention it is um, uh, the fact that uh, Edgerome, um, uh, every implementation that I've seen um, uses PEEP. You can set up radio servers so they can deal with different uh, EAP methods. Um, and uh, while we do see EAP TLS used for uh, a lot of university networks where you're still running your own SSID and not using um, Edgerome, um, I, I really think that there's a lot of value in being able to differentiate your user, but you can do it in a lot of different places. Um, there's certainly still the opportunity to you know, just use the edge of Rome SSID, but know that when someone authenticates that they're their user and you give them a certain experience access control wise versus the guests on your network. But the street that our office is in, which is Lonsdale Street, was surrounded by um, a lot of uh, training colleges and um, uh, a lot of the, 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 the more regional institutions have their city presences in our street. And so we're, we just sit there and, and, I, and I can see, it's, it's a question of who's edgy roam. So I can see, you know, this universities and this universities to users who may roam and, and through that because they're just going somewhere else, it's all the same. Um, but uh, it's something that could have an unintended uh, access control experience for your users, even if you are making decisions based on um, their identity because 
they may roam to another network, um, and uh, it, that's called the same thing. And as far as their supplicants concerned, it's just re-authenticated to the same network, even though that, that's been sort of dealt with by, uh, by after the fact. So, um, but the main reason I bring it up, and this is what's always been the problem with PEEP, is um, uh, users choose terrible passwords. Um, and often we allow them to choose terrible passwords. And so account and password policies that are way up in group policy objects in Active Directory or that are enforced by identity management systems um, uh, may actually enable uh, um, uh, this problem for us. And in some cases, um, depending on the network, I would almost rather use a, a well-selected pre-shared key, not that you do this for a bunch of users, but um, then, then allow users to set passwords. Uh, and, and this is with recognizing that uh, WPA2 um, pre-shared key and WPA pre-shared key are, are problematic and are subject to um, just basically scale of attack by uh, um, uh, however much you can invest in cracking things. So other things I like about directories, um, uh, I, I love LDAP. Um, uh, we uh, f uh, find uh, poorly secured LDAP fairly frequently. Uh, we'll have situations where we can pull things like um, a crypt passwords is stored in LDAP out, um, and then we take them away and crack them. Um, I use them to enumerate things about the environment. Um, but where we usually encounter these are um, systems that are kind of uh, uh, giving a bit of a hat tip to uh, the era of NIS, NIS Plus, like uh, of, of Unix integrated directory services um, uh, that uh, are, are using LDAP. And um, uh, we often, often find them in the city infrastructure space, the Unix system space, that uh, they're in use. And many will at least support anonymous bind. So while we may not be able to get, um, depending on the restrictions available or applied to us, we may not be able to get a, uh, um, a passport or a user hash, I can get things like um, the, the user ID itself. Um, so we'll get a whole list of all the user IDs in the environment and then just do a kind of horizontal password guessing of take a common password, take 100,000 accounts and just cycle through the environment um, uh, and just uh, guess that way. So, but um, uh, two-factor authentication uh, is, especially in, in, in uh, management infrastructure um, and management systems, is something that we, we would love to see more of. Um, recognizing that you have to strike that balance between returning something to the service, especially in the network space, that uh, you don't want to create dependencies on external things that, that um, slow you down when fixing things. Um, so on management services, uh, for infrastructure itself, I, I try to work my way back to targeting your management systems. So the sort of um, uh, WCS, NCS, Prime, like SolarWinds, like all of these, these sort of systems um, that you use for your, your stoplight and traffic systems, um, we try to, to, to gain access to those because um, especially uh, systems like that use uh, uh, SNMP to query private MIBs in infrastructure, um, your community strings are in those management systems, so we try to target those. Um, in the provisioning systems that you use to build systems that you use to back up and archive uh, your configurations to, we like to attack um, TFTP servers. Um, it's usually fun to try to guess your uh, file structure. Um, if we can, it's, it's, uh, depends on how much feedback we get from your TFTP server, which is usually not much but we just shouldn't be able to reach it. Um, and uh, uh, there are TFTP servers that we can commonly reach. I was looking for a phone down here. Um, often um, uh, behind VoIP systems, there's, a, there's their provisioning um, TFTP servers, but um, those don't usually provide us a lot of value other than maybe a little bit of information about the environment because it depends on how, depends on the, on the solution, depends on what's being distributed from that. Um, but where you integrate, say you have like Cisco call manager, whatever it's called these days, um, and then uh, um, like UCS, I think, yeah. But um, that and then uh, um, your, your voice devices that are related to that, but then you introduce um, uh, video conference systems to integrate with that or uh, conference what? phones or these sort of things that have a different provisioning approach and they're either manually configured directly, which means they probably will have default um, credentials in them for us, um, or they also get their config from TFTP um, and some of them may not uh, protect the uh, identity of the extension as, as well as uh, other things. Um, where we also find this uh, fun, and this is a screen capture, this is just a, a grabbing things out of a, a Red Hat satellite server, for example, because uh, TFTP and NFS are frequently combined together and used for um, provisioning those systems. And so um, uh, all the stuff that you do post-build, um, where you introduce like users and have user hashes that come from this, 
if you don't have uh, some kind of process with like Chef or Puppet or something like that that after the fact resets that password, um, we get the hash out of, out of uh, the TFTP provisioning for those systems and then we go off and, and try to crack it and, and uh, try to build on that. Um, again, reminder, this is, <laughs> network is, is good fun for us. Um, uh, we uh, like, uh, again, to, to find ourselves in one part of the environment. Um, this, this doesn't really usually happen. Like usually this, the thinking, even management, is pretty separate with this. So I've kind of made that look worse than it, it generally is. But um, uh, be, uh, some devices will allow you to, to put good access controls around their own management interfaces, like SNMP and SSH and, and web interfaces, you're using those, um, to only allow them to be manageable from the management stations. Um, but you've got a lot of different sorts of devices, and not everything um, can, uh, can employ those kind of access controls. So if we can get on a device and, uh, um, and then use it to explore the networks around us, then we may be able to sort of further our attack. Um, file service is internal to, your, to the networks or, or problematic for us. I won't go into this too much um, uh, other than that, because I, I think that especially uh, with attacks on SMB and CIFS um, that a lot of people were aware of, of uh, uh, some of the, the risks of having these, and certainly having them internet accessible isn't good. Um, uh, I certainly have found internet accessible NFS before, and uh, infrastructure that was happy to let me, you know, uh, uh, interrogate the, uh, the 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 listening, like the, the port mapper, find the NFS server, mount the vo the volumes remotely um, through the border control, through uh, in some cases the data center for our world type environments and that. But it's um, yeah, so um. Uh, another area that's that's problematic for us is, um, is is patching, and I think moving away from platforms and onto infrastructure specifically, um, when you get out of the off the sort of beaten path as far as um, uh, getting into uh, more of the IoT sort of side of infrastructure versus fleets of you know we have a certain models of, of of devices that we use for our network edge and 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 so on like your your well managed parts of the environment, these devices are frequently left. Um, uh, unpatched. Some of them, by their design, are meant to be very remotely accessible. So we've we've had a number of situations where we've breached uh, higher education environments because of video conferencing systems. Um, and and what it usually is is that it's not even getting on the video conferencing system and messing with the people at the other end, which we like to do. But it's more of a um, uh, the fact that uh, these are uh, uh, underneath it generally uh, are a general purpose computer at, at some level. They do would have like an embedded version of Linux. <coughs> They would have default credentials, and if we can SSH into that, um, we can then use port forwarding in order to, to effectively uh, use its position inside of your network. And if you trust that system more than you trust an external system, then we can take advantage of that. So um, uh, same, same with uh, uh, brocade storage switches. I'll name that vendor um, since they OEM for, uh, for a lot of people. Um, we have, have found a number of storage switches which are remotely accessible because they're a turnkey solution provided by an external party who has to manage it. And they're accessible to us. And um, with certain storage switches, just through firmware analysis, we found a whole bunch of, of uh, undocumented um, uh, users that are in it. Um, in the case of Brocade, they had a number of extra UID zero users. So it's a, it's a Unix-based system. So there's a root user has UID zero. Then there were a number of other users that also were created that have UID zero, and they have very trivial passwords, and they're not something that uh, the vendor walks you through resetting. They're there, I think, for their remote management and maintenance, but um, they're, they're, they're a problem. And so we can get onto that, and then we've built a lot of tools uh, to allow us to introduce, um, because in the case of Brocades, for many years, they were PowerPC-based. Uh, CPU, so we just cross compiled a bunch of tools, statically linked them, and shoved them on it, and used it basically to port scan the networks from your storage switch. Um, but uh, I skipped over this. I'm not a a, a huge fan of, of hiding our problems, um, but uh, there are a lot of cases in university networks where there is a reason why we have a Solaris 2.6 system in the environment uh, because it's connected to some very expensive piece of equipment. Um, and for those situations, I try to just encourage um, uh, special casing them and creating a little walled garden to put them in and not allowing them to be reachable or to reach anything else if possible. Um, because those sort of solutions um, uh, shouldn't be accessible in general networks. And we're continually surprised at what we actually um, uh, find out there. Um, I mentioned the, the cloud, uh, 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 cloud shifting and moving to hybrid models and cloud-only models. 
um, are, are, uh, can be problematic. Um, we have had uh, a, a, a number of vendors that we've come across that rather than using something that is a little more in your, in your control, like SAML, um, they have permitted, uh, they've asked to be able to bind directly to your LDAP server and to authenticate your users. There's even a couple of different ways we can do that. Um, they were the worst way. They wanted to, rather than um, authenticating as a user, they would, uh, yeah, they would uh, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, bind as that. So yes, all right. So I'm being told to speed up, so I will. Um, Multi-tenant, um, what we do is we, we have had a number of situations where either through the application uh, or through the platform or through the storage used on it, um, we will attack one institution and then be able to reach data that's there for another institution. Um, and it's just a case of, of the external parties not um, practicing segregation in that. Um, if we can access it, we can probably attack it. Um, uh, serial, uh, serial ports, console ports on accessible technology um, are always uh, useful. Um, really quickly, uh, research networks. And um, in my experience, uh, for a lot of different reasons, um, they're a less governed um, environment uh, than the general university networks are. And I'm not saying that to be disparaging of anything, it's just the reality that we see. Um, uh, sometimes it's because of the, the nature of the research that's being done that needs to have a fairly free and open environment. Um, but uh, I think that a lot of institutions' decision to put those problems sort of outside of their normal managed infrastructure um, is, is good from the point of view of you don't have to take responsibility for it, but they, those, those uh, networks still share your reputation. Um, so it's something that's important for us to, to sort of deal with that. So um, I am wrapping up now. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we, we really suggest you block a lot of common annoying things. Like this is, this is not new, new news to anyone here, I think, as well. Um, moving on to infrastructure itself. Um, uh, putting access control uh, either on the host, on the network, or ideally both um, around uh, your management systems is really important. Um, uh, if you, like I try to encourage people to move on to, to SNMP version three, but it's, uh, uh, if it's just not practical, I try to encourage people to compartmentalize that. But um, we still find a lot of reverse telnet servers uh, in environments connected to device consoles that we may or may not be able to access, so that's something that we would suggest looking at. Um, but yeah, um, thank you very much for listening to my ranting on, and um, if you have any questions, uh, probably I'll be happy to answer after the, the panel, so just do that. Cool. Thanks.